Good morning, River Church. Happy 4th of July weekend. Uh, we thank you so much for joining us today. Let's take this time to stand together and worship the Lord. Okay. 
Father, we thank you for this day, the day that you have made, and let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for this time that we have together. We ask that you would prepare our hearts and our minds for the message that you have prepared for us, Lord. We ask you to hold off the rain so we could have some food and fellowship together. And we just praise and thank you, Lord, for all the good that you do. Father, we just want to take a minute and thank you and praise you and open our hearts to you, Lord. There's some people who can't be here today. There's family members that are sick, friends who are sick. Let's just take a moment and, and lift them up to you. our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, River Church. So for those of you who don't know me, my name's Todd Osowski. I'm one of the elders here. Uh, for any new people, welcome. Uh, we do, maybe they said this already, I might have missed it, but if for you who, who don't know this already, if you have the Version Bible app, uh, you can find all the songs and the scriptures that will be referring to today on the YouVersion Bible app. Just go to the more section all the way to the bottom right. Click on events. You'll see two churches there. There's the Quinnebog River Church and Gallup Hill Baptist Church. Uh, obviously choose ours and uh, you'll see all the lineup for today's session. Uh, so thank you for, for coming here today. Special thanks to uh, Carlos and Brian. I, I pulled out of my car this morning and all I could smell was bacon. I mean, these guys were cooking up some bacon and sausage. So, and they're gonna. And t this afternoon, when we break, they they got their grills there, and whatever kind of meat you have, they're gonna cook it up. So, I just want to say, give you guys a hand right now, because we're not gonna see you later. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Really, thank you for getting up early, and and they got some awesome grills. Just looking at the grills gets me excited. Uh, so thank you for coming here today. Today is communion day. So if you haven't already, there's a little cup with the wafer on it. It's all pre-portioned and packaged. We, we bought them like this. So no, no worries about uh, any germs here. So there, this is all packaged for you. Underneath that tent behind you, we have a table. Grab one of those if you haven't already. Um, or raise your hand if you want someone to grab that for you. So today uh, we will be having some fellowship after service and probably just for a couple of hours. So we think this is going to hold off till three o'clock. Uh, we have some games we'll play, some food, and just enjoy one another's company. Uh, the only far other announcement that I have is on the 18th, which is a couple Saturdays away, we want to get some people together to meet at 32 School Street, our home of our church. Uh, we're going to unload the trailer there. We have a trailer that was donated to us with a bunch of youth supplies and other things in there. Uh, we could use a few guys or ladies, whoever wants to come join, uh, bring a truck, vehicle. We have another um, storage facility that we're going to move a lot of those items to so that we can use the trailer on site for some of the construction that's already begun and some other storage of actual materials we're going to need for the church. So. Um, let's see, any other announcements you can think of? No? We're good. All right, so uh, I'm going to pray for Josh as he comes up and gets ready to give us a sermon. Father, we thank you again for this day. Thank you for your word that is truth. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you would continually speak to us through your word and bless it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I did think of something, Todd. You became a grandfather again this past week. So we'd like to welcome, uh, Justin is here with his two older children, Ellie and Elias. He's the one with the Tonka truck. Uh, but they welcomed Ezra, is it Raymond is the middle name? Ezra Raymond Renucci. And so they're home resting, is that right? 
with Christy. Christy's doing okay. So, hey, one way or the other, River Church is going to grow and expand the gospel influence. We call that biological gospel expansion. We're big fans of it here at River Church. So congratulations to the Renucci. Who's on deck now? Is it, Brooke, are you on deck? With your due date? August 24th. Do we have anyone closer than August 24th? So Brooke is on deck, and uh, that'll be exciting. So keep up the good work, River Church, and congratulations to the Renucci's. This morning, I'm going to be wrapping up our study of the book of Philippians. We've been taking a very specific view of Philippians. Oh, and welcome online viewers. It is so good to see you guys. Thanks for staying safe. Some of you are on vacation. Some of you are still sheltering. That's awesome, but we're glad that you're here with us this morning. We're wrapping up our time in Philippians, and we've been looking at the occurrence of the word that we know of as fellowship or partnership or sharing. The Greek word is koinonia. It occurs four times in the book of Philippians. Today is the last occurrence. It's found in Philippians chapter 4, and we'll be looking at verses 15 through 20. So if you have your version app or your Bible, you can turn there. That's where we're going to find the last occurrence of this New Testament concept in the book of Philippians. Each of the occurrences in the book of Philippians have a different nuance or a different shade of meaning. And so we've been talking about how koinonia, fellowship, is a gospel fellowship, that Christians share something special because we embrace Jesus Christ by faith. We see that koinonia is the ability of people to put other people's concerns ahead of theirs, even if you're not related, like we know that families do that. But koinonia is a kind of Christian fellowship where Christians, because of their love for each other and Jesus, will actually put the concerns of others ahead of them. Hence, you have the platform for Christian ministry. And then last week we saw that koinonia involves a degree of suffering to complete the suffering of Jesus Christ for the church that we are, we actually look forward to and count it a privilege to suffer at times so that the gospel may advance. Today we're going to be looking at the last nuance of koinonia found in the book of Philippians, but here's the thought. Today we're celebrating uh, the 4th of July weekend, and here's my question for you. When the framers of the Constitution and the Founding Fathers declared their independence from King George and Great Britain, which we are celebrating on July 4th, why was it that when England sent soldiers over to the colonies, why didn't God intervene miraculously? Like, there's been lots of conversations about whether or not the framers of the Constitution were men of faith, but we know for a certainty that the Lord was appealed to, and biblical principles were put into place. The whole idea of the all being created equal, that's not something that they came up with on their own. That is something that they saw in the pages of Scripture. Why didn't God intervene miraculously and, like, do the kinds of things that we see in the Old Testament when Israel was established? Like, why didn't the ships meet a hurricane, you know, off of Cape Cod? Why didn't the ocean open up and swallow the British army? Why, why weren't there whales and, you know, sea serpents that would pummel the ships, that would keep them from coming to shore? Like, wouldn't that have been a great opportunity for God to bring glory and honor to himself by miraculously providing for this something new, this new republic that was established using biblical ideas and principles that some nations are run by kings, But we want a nation that is actually led by the people. Uh, That's a biblical idea. Why didn't God miraculously provide? And why is the story of July 4th the story of a resulting fight that we won rather than God's miraculous provision? Maybe you never thought about it that way. But we are a people who continually want to see God provide for us miraculously. Like if we could continue to see God do miraculous things in our culture and in our families, I think we would all say that, yeah, that would strengthen my faith. To, there would be undeniable proof that God is, because honestly, we know he created the world, but so many people are blind to that. Where is God moving with miraculous power now? We would love to see more miracles. Kind of the big idea of where we're going to see from the text this morning is that God is continuing to provide miraculously, but it's something that we've overlooked and we've underappreciated, and I want to show you from the text what I'm talking about. Possibly the reason that God did not provide for the Continental Army through a display of miraculous defeat of the British invasion force is because the greater miracle 
is that we bound together and we won. That in itself, quite possibly, is the greater and more important miracle. God probably decided that he would receive more honor and glory from a people who overcame their differences and fought together than if God moved unilaterally and did handle business himself. Let's take a look at the text and see what we say, but that's where we're heading this morning in Philippians chapter 4. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verses 15 and 16, and then I want to tell you a story. Beginning in verse 15 of Philippians chapter 4, this is Paul speaking, And you Philippians know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even in Thessalonica you sent gifts for my need several times. What is Paul talking about? If you remember from Acts chapter 16 and Acts chapter 17, Paul and Silas were on their second missionary journey. They went to Philippi. They met Lydia and the women of prayer down by the river. They shared the gospel, baptized them. A house church started that day. Paul only spent a few weeks, maybe a few months at the most in Philippi, planted the church, but he ended up being thrown in jail and beaten unjustly. Ultimately, he ended up leaving Philippi. In this text, he says, I left Macedonia. Philippi is located in Macedonia. He traveled 90 miles to the west, a three-day journey. He walked 30 miles a day for three days and stopped in Thessalonica. In Thessalonica, he's still recovering from his wounds that he received from the Philippian jailer, the Philippian jailer. It's been a 90-mile journey by foot. And he begins to go to synagogue to synagogue on Saturdays to share the gospel, as was his habit. A few weeks go by. People get so riled up in Thessalonica that a mob forms and they go to the polytarch, a word that many scholars thought that Luke made up, found in the book of Acts, until they found it carved in a marble column in Thessalonica. Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, is so detailed he was using terms that were lost to history that we now have an appreciation for. But in Acts chapter 17, the polytarchs came and persecuted Paul, but they couldn't find him. Jason had hidden Paul. Paul was on the run. He's underground. He's out of sight. He couldn't face another beating. Okay, this is where he was at. Couldn't handle another beating. Jason, his host, covers for him, and they say, Jason, we are going to exact from you a certain sum of money. You will get it back only if and when Paul leaves town. And if Paul ever comes back, we're going to take that money back from you. Jason had to pay a pledge to the polytarchs saying that according to this amount of money, I will make sure Paul leaves. In the book of Thessalonians, Paul says, I want to return to you in Thessalonica, but evil has prevented me from doing so. Quite possibly it's because he knew that if he ever returned to Thessalonica, Jason would be in debt again. This might be the evil that Paul is referring to in 1 Thessalonians. Jason fronts the money. Paul escapes and goes to Berea, where the text in Acts chapter 17 says that they were of more noble mind and were willing to search the scriptures to see if what Paul said was true. Here's the deal. Paul needed help. He had literally been beaten and chased out of town after town where churches had been planted, but his back is up against the ropes. Re now that you know the history behind those two verses, let me read them again. And you Philippians know that in the early days of the gospel, the beginning of the second missionary journey of Paul, when I left Macedonia, which is where Philippi is, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even in Thessalonica, when I was underground and on the run, you sent gifts for my need several times. Here's the idea behind these two verses. Don't miss this because we're going to introduce this concept of koinonia that's found in these verses here, and you need to know the context. Paul was well known in Jerusalem as a scholar. Paul first preached the gospel in Antioch. On his first missionary journey, he planted churches in Pisidian Antioch, on the island of Cyprus, in Iconium, in Lystra, in Derbe, and... We also know that Paul studied and reflected and made his first initial decisions of faith in his hometown of Tarsus. That's eight different cities where Paul was known as a man of faith, four of which he'd planted churches in. Nobody was partnering with him. Nobody was supporting him in the work of the gospel. 
We know that Paul was a tent maker, literally. We now use the term to mean someone who works so that they can minister without being a burden to the church financially. That term comes from the fact that Paul supported his own self by actually making tents. But of the eight cities where he had a clear gospel presence, four in which he had planted churches, none of them partnered with him. The one church that sent him financial relief when he was underground, on the run, persecuted, was the baby church. The brand new church. The church that was just 90 miles to the east. Of all the churches that Paul had helped start at that time, only the church in Philippi financially supported him. He refers to this as partnering, as koinonia, as fellowship. There is a financial aspect to koinonia where the church meets the church's needs. And Paul is saying it was rare, it was special, it was holy because of the eight different communities that could have been only Philippi, the newest, the youngest, and the weakest, and arguably the most heavily persecuted, was the only church that sent gifts time and again and found Paul when he was underground in Thessalonica. Continuing in the text, let's see how God responds to that kind of koinonia or that par- kind of partnering or fellowship. Paul continues in verse 17, Not that I seek the gift. Paul's talking about money. It's sensitive. Everybody gets it. So here he goes, right? Not that I sought the gift. He just got done saying in verse 14, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? So he's trying to be very respectful of the fact that he's not begging for money right here. But he's also trying to encourage the Philippians to keep the partnership going. That it is a holy thing. And he's about ready to show them how right here. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that is increasing to your account. But I have received everything in full, and I have an abundance. I am fully supplied, having received from Epaphroditus, the messenger, what you provided, a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Please don't miss three very important words in those two short verses. There is a cycle of met needs when the church practices fellowship, partnering, sharing, koinonia. And Paul mentions it here. Please note this cycle. Beginning in verse 15, Paul says that there is profit. Literally, the word is fruit in the original language. Paul is saying there is bountiful fruit to your account. That you have been rewarded. That the Lord is blessing you because of your kindness and koinonia and partnering with me. So to the ones who give, God is giving in turn. He is giving fruit to their account. They are harvesting what they didn't plant. God is blessing them. Paul goes on to say, I have received everything in full and I have abundance. In koinonia, the one who is on the leading edge of the gospel, the one who is suffering, the one who is preaching, the one who is leveraging everything, in this case Paul, he has an abundance. He is in hiding, being persecuted, running from one beating to another, and yet his needs are being met. So there is a blessing for those that partnered with him, the church of Philippi. There is a blessing for Paul because he has his needs met abundantly. And finally, take a look at this. A fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. So there's profit to the church that gave, there's abundance to Paul who received, and there is glory, there is a pleasing offering. God is happy. There is a cycle of needs being announced, needs being met, and God then providing for his church. The church in partnership with a missionary, in partnership with God, and it is this beautiful cycle. The church is blessed, Paul has his needs met, and God is honored and glorified. And Paul brings this to their attention. Not that I have any need. I can do all things through Christ who has strengthened me. He was called by God. He's going to make tents until the cows came home so that he could preach the gospel. But how much more effective was his preaching when he didn't have to work a side job or a full-time job to preach the gospel, especially when he's in hiding? So the church in Philippi blessed Paul, and Paul wanted them to know, I'm going to talk about money, but I don't want it to be weird, because you need to understand that koinonia is a gospel partnership. We put each other's needs ahead of our own. We're willing to suffer for each other, even to give to each other, and God is honored and glorified when we do. The cycle of met needs is glorious. And finally, verses 19 to 20. And my God will supply 
all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. What Paul is basically saying to the church in Philippi is that when they partnered with him, they experienced a need. They experienced a loss. Resources that were theirs, they gave to him. There's a negative in their account. Spiritually, they're being rewarded. Spiritually, they're being blessed. But Paul says that their partnership positions them for godly repayment. That the amount that you blessed me with, God is going to restore to you. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. God looks down and says, thank you, church in Philippi, for meeting the needs of Paul right now. Now you are potentially experiencing a time of need. It, it behooves my glory to personally meet your need. Paul is saying that partnership, koinonia, bearing the needs of others, financially, physically, positions the church for godly repayment because he will not let his bride suffer for lack, especially if they have been busy about financing and providing for the continuing work of the gospel in their region and in regions beyond. It is a powerful concept. And when you think about that aspect of koinonia, it's really encouraging. In just these six verses, Paul is laying out a tremendous theology of what it looks like when the church meets needs. Why hasn't God provided miraculously for River Church? Why don't we have more money than we need in our account right now to build on 32 School Street? Why are we going into a season where the Lord has blessed us with the finances to make a really good start, but the reality is in September we're going to run out of money while there's still a project ahead of us? Why hasn't the Lord just like in the process of kicking around the property and doing the initial site work, why haven't we found like Chief Uncas's treasure chest? Like why hasn't something like that happened? Doesn't the Lord want this project to be fully financed? Doesn't the Lord want a permanent home for a church in the heart of Jewett City that can share the gospel and open up its doors during the week and provide programming? Of course he does. He's moved time and time again to provide for that. But why hasn't he provided miraculously? Now, maybe he will. You know, we're not going to rule that out. We have seen the Lord move powerfully. I think the reason is because according to this concept of koinonia, of the church joining together to meet needs, to serve the community with the gospel, that God receives more honor and glory from doing a work in and through us than he does miraculously to us. You see, if, if, if we found a, a, a box of treasure on 32 School Street, and it paid for the project and the splash pad and every other thing, it would create quite a stir, uh, quite a stir. And God would get recognition for sure. But a lot of people would just write it off as good luck or fate or chance. That it could have happened to anybody. It just happens that the church bought the property and dug the hole and found the pirate's treasure, right? But when God moves through a group of people, and honestly, <laughs> a small group of people, we are not overwhelming numbers. But when God moves through a group of people who are willing to partner with him as a church to meet the needs of a community for the gospel, the glory that God receives will cause the community to stand up and say, what is happening there? This came out of nowhere. God is moving through these people. I think the miracle is that partnering is more of a miracle than, than a miracle is. We understand God's ability to do the amazing, and we hope that he does. But it's easy for us to overlook the everyday miracle that happens when the church gathers for a gospel pro project and is willing to partner together to make it happen. That is a miracle for which God receives tremendous glory, more so than if he were to part the sea and sink the invading English army or allow us to discover a pirate's chest of gold on the church property. And so today, by way of wrapping up our time together this morning for the message anyways, we're going to share in a time of communion. And during our time of communion, we want to remember the fact that the power of God is such that it dwells in and through us in such a way that is actually more miraculous 
than the power of God sometimes just to us. And so as we move into a time of communion, if you didn't have an opportunity to grab one of these little communion uh, bundles, they're on the back table, and there might be some folks distributing them as well. Uh, I'm going to share with you uh, one final scripture this morning. I'm going to pray, and then we will observe communion together. These are also the words of Paul as he writes to the church that he started in Corinth. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he, Jesus, was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he also took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant established by my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Would you join me while I pray? And then after the prayer, we'll take communion together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for partnering with us. Lord, there is no doubt that we want to see you move in miraculous power in 06351 and the surrounding community and in eastern Connecticut. And Lord, would you? We are not opposed to your miraculous manifestations of power at all. In fact, we're big fans. But Lord, this morning from the text, we see that the greater miracle is when Jesus' prayer is answered. Because Jesus prayed, let my church be defined by their love for each other. Let my church be known as one. That, Heavenly Father, would take a miraculous answer to prayer. And that would take a greater work of faith and you would receive more glory when your church acts as one in love for each other and in love for you. And so, Father, this morning, for some of us, maybe we've never thought about this aspect of the gospel before, and we have realized that we have been living selfishly, we have been hoarding our resources, and the most important thing we could do is pledge ourselves by faith to you. It sounds like this. Heavenly Father, I do not want to live a life defined by my own needs anymore. I want to live a life that is defined by advancing your kingdom. By faith, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I receive these elements of communion by faith. They represent the body and the blood that was shed for me. How can I withhold myself and my resources when you have provided everything for salvation, joy and peace in this life, and eternal life to come? I repent of my sin that has kept me from you. And I ask you to forgive me and to bring me, you in, bring me into your family. For others of us, Lord, who have prayed a prayer like that, maybe many years ago, we are challenged anew, Lord, that your kingdom is on the move. And that as much as we would like to see miracles, we need to grow in our appreciation of the miracle that is the church. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to set each other's needs above our own, that we would be willing to suffer for your gospel, that we would be willing to partner with you and in the case of River Church to build and to build quickly and to move in and to bring you honor and praise in a place that you have provided for. But most importantly, Father, we thank you for the gospel partnership that we have with you. It is our joy, it is our privilege to receive communion together this morning as we reflect on these things. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take communion together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather this morning, whether it be online or in person. Thank you for providing for River Church. Thank you for continuing to provide for every church in Eastern Connecticut. Father, we pray that you would find the praise rising to you from indoors and out and from people's homes, a pleasing sacrifice to you. Lord, would you strengthen your church? 
as we continue to delight in the fellowship that we can share as men and women of faith. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me as we wrap up our time together this morning? Construction has begun, it is continuing, and so, you know, what better way to celebrate that than with a big cake? So even if you have to head out quick and you're not going to stay for the time of fellowship, grab a piece of cake. We love you guys. Good morning. God bless.